Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Thank you for tuning in to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, I'm your host, Joel Berg. And thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We're here today with Dr. Juan Fernando Yepes, once again, this time to talk about radiology and imaging in pediatric dental practice. Dr. Yepes is a full professor in the Department of Pediatric Dentistry at Indiana University School of Dentistry and an attending at Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Yepes is also an adjunct professor at the University of Buffalo School of Dental Medicine, Department of Pediatric and Community Dentistry. He is a dentist and a physician from Xavier University in Bogota, Colombia. In 1999, Dr. Yepes moved to the United States and attended the University of Iowa and the University of Pennsylvania, where he completed a fellowship and residency in radiology and in oral medicine, respectively. In 2006, he completed a master in public health training, and in 2011, a doctor degree in public health as well, both with emphasis in epidemiology at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. In 2008, he completed a residency program in dental public health at Texas A&M University College of Dentistry. Finally, he completed a residency program and master in pediatric dentistry at the University of Kentucky in 2012. He is triple boarded by the American Boards of Pediatric Dentistry, Oral Medicine, and Dental Public Health. He is an active member of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the American Academy of Oral Medicine, the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology, and the Indiana Dental Association, as well as, as well as the American Dental Association. And he is a fellow in dental surgery from the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. He is a member of the editorial board of Oral Surgery, Oral Medicine, Oral Path, and Oral Radiology. Well, I think we've established you as an expert, Dr. Yepes, so thanks for being with us once again. The last time you spoke with us was regarding clinical exam and what, what I referred to as the Yepes method for oral examination, looking for uh, lesions uh, during routine exam. And today we're going to talk about imaging in pediatric dentistry. So thanks for being with us, first of all, Dr. Yepes, and thanks for coming back to our audience can hear you again. Dr. Berg and all the members of the Academy and guests who are listening to this podcast, thank you so much for the invitation. As I said a couple of weeks ago when we talked about oral lesions, this is an absolute honor. I have been waiting for this invitation for a long time, especially this one about radiology. So thank you so much. We're honored to have you, and uh, you're an icon already in our specialty, and your voice is recognized, particularly with that Kentucky accent of yours, yes, yes, yes. as Especially, you describe. Yeah, now it's Indiana accent. That's right. Love it. I was born in Indiana, so I'm a loyalist. Anyway, <laughs> let's, let's get on with the subject matter at hand, and I wanted to ask you, we were having a conversation before, should we call the subject today radiology, or should we call it imaging? And what I mean there is, you know, radiology, you think of radiation and ionizing radiation and x-rays. Mostly, that's what we're going to talk about today. But now we're getting into the world where we have other forms of what are maybe more collectively called imaging. So radiology, including MRI, which is not ionizing radiation, and CAT scans, which are. But then we have caries detection and, all, and, and ultrasound. So what should we call this discipline just to get that out of the way? Imaging or radiology? Dr. Berg, that's a good question. I probably will prefer, because in that way we will be in the same page, to call this conversation about imaging and dentistry. So we will use a more broad term. In that way, we can include other imaging who are not necessarily ionizing radiation related. Thank you. That's helpful. So we'll talk about imaging. Mostly we're going to talk about things that do use ionizing radiation. That's mostly what we do. So I have a lot of things to talk to you about today in our short podcast. So I'm going to get going. And I'm going to get to the YEPES method as it relates to radiological examination as well. But the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, in, in the years in academics, I was involved with radiologists such as yourself, and the new notion of having an image read, quote unquote, as opposed to not. And what I mean by that is, you know, in medical radiologies, <clears throat> I'm telling you things that you know, but I want you to elaborate on this, that when you get any kind of x-ray performed, the technician takes the image of the x-ray 
captures it, but a radiologist reads the image, makes an interpretation of the image, writes a report, and gets compensated for writing that report. So we're often asked about when should we get reports done. We take a lot of you know, extra oral images, such as panoramics or cephalograms. Um, you know, certainly if we had a, a cone beam CT, maybe we would think about getting it read. But talk a little bit about the concept of interpretation, reading, and when should we do that as pediatric dentists or order that? Because we can't, you can, you're an oral radiologist, but we can't actually interpret an image uh, legally within our license. So please explain that. Well, Dr. Burke, I consider myself the superhero of the interpretation. I dream about interpretation. My day is about interpretation. My shampoo that I use every morning is interpretation. The conditioner is interpretation. Basically, in a very straightforward, every time that we take a radiograph or every time that we use any kind of imaging, that imaging must absolutely must be next to the interpretation report. But let me I take a little bit away of the, you know, maybe some of the listeners of this podcast, they are looking and say, well, what do you mean? Do I need to refer every time that I take a periapical? Do I need to send a periapical for interpretation? No. Every dentist, when you take any kind of images in your office, you must provide an interpretation of that image. It doesn't mean that you need to write three paragraphs or you need to write a whole textbook about that particular bite wing. An interpretation is just one sentence, no carry detected. An interpretation is maybe one more sentence, no bone lesions. So interpretation doesn't mean a pretty comprehensive, long paragraph. Every time that we take a radiograph in a dental office, we bill for the technical component, and the technical component pays for the panoramic machine or the x-ray machine and for the sensor, for the phosphoroplates. But we need to keep in mind that that fee that we are going to get compensated also include a portion, which is the professional interpretation. So interpretation must be an activity that we perform every time that we obtain an imaging in the office. To finish, Dr. Berg, and I don't want to go in too many details because, as you said, we have a short time and we have too many topics. Imagine you take a panoramic film. That panoramic film in your electronic health records or your paper records, whatever you use, you need to write a, a couple of sentences. Panoramic film within normal limits, no bone lesions, temporomandibular joints normal. You need to acknowledge in your records that you took the time to look at that film. So as I said, you know, uh, interpretation is my life, absolutely my life. So I want to talk a little bit more about interpretation as it relates to us and pediatric dentists, not radiologists, in practice. And you've talked about the YEPA's steps for a succinct interpretation report, and you just explained clearly to us that we also have to have some kind of interpretation. So let's take a panoramic. It's the best example. We routinely take panoramic uh, radiographs, and we look at them, and we're looking for development. We're looking for dental orthodontic uh, things. We're also looking for pathology uh, to make sure we're ruling out things that may uh, come up in a routine image. So it, what, what, what differentiates an interpretation that we make from those that we need to refer to you or other radiologists? How do we make that decision? Some things may seem obvious, but give us a guideline of how to go through that process of deciding, I need to send this out to a radiologist for an interpretation. Okay, so the first thing is, Every time that we take a panoramic film, every single time, regardless if we see something unusual or it seems to be normal, we need to provide a very systematic, step-by-step -step interpretation of that film. And listen to this. Even if it's a normal film, that requires a step-by-step, -step, systematic, very organized looking at that panoramic film. If we see something unusual... And believe me, Dr. Berg, from my heart, if you see something unusual in a panoramic film, and again, you know, we may have different threshold for what we call unusual, but just imagine there is something on the left side of the mandible. Regardless if you are going to submit that film for an advanced interpretation, you as a pediatric dentist, you as a practitioner, you need to look at that lesion, and you need to describe the lesion, and you need to provide an interpretation of the lesion. 
even if you don't know the final diagnosis, or maybe your diagnosis is different from the final diagnosis, the exercise of providing an interpretation for that unusual finding must be part of our life as a pediatric dentist. Then, after we provide an interpretation, we may actually end up the interpretation report with two or three potential lesions that may actually match that interpretation. Then you can refer the film for someone else to help you with the interpretation, or you can refer the patient maybe to another surgeon to maybe take a biopsy. But regardless if you refer or not, we always need to go ahead, describe that lesion, based on the description, provide two or three potential differential diagnoses, or, and then refer the patient. Let me, I finish with this, and quite often when I'm lecturing, some people will approach me and say, what is the point of getting, you know, learning the five steps of a good interpretation report if I'm just going to refer the patient anyway? Well, the point is, we are dentists, we are pediatric dentists, and we, as a pediatric dentist, we must be able to provide an interpretation and a potential differential diagnosis. Otherwise, what is the point if you just take the panoramic film and you just call your oral surgeon friend and say, you know, I'm sending you a 12-year-old with an unusual lesion in the left mandible. Thank you so much. I think so. We need to call the oral surgeon and say, I'm referring you a 12-year-old with the five steps that we may talk later on this podcast with the five steps of a good radiographic description. And you can tell the oral surgeon, based on my assessment of the lesion, I believe could be A, B, or C. Please give me a call as soon as you figure it out what is the final diagnosis. Yeah, and I think this falls well within the scope of our practice as pediatric dentists. We're the only specialty that's about a population and not about a specific area of practice. So just like pediatricians in medicine, who are the go-to place for emergencies, for assessing broken limbs, uh, we have to have some kind of method of that initial assessment in all areas of practice. I, I want to ask you very briefly, tell us the five steps which would be helpful to us about interpreting as we're interpreting. This is such an important, such an important topic as we interpret ourselves. Very quickly, tell us what are the five steps for an interpretation report for us. Okay, the first step is tell your brain that ameloblastoma is not a diagnosis. Let me I repeat the first step. Tell your brain that ameloblastoma is not a diagnosis. Now, in a serious way, the first step is tell your brain not to tell you the potential diagnosis until you finish the description. Because, because that's one of the major mistakes, that you see something unusual, and then that radiolucency at the left mandible, your brain will tell you, oh, it's an ameloblastoma, which, by the way, Dr. Berg, I really don't get why ameloblastoma is so sweet to our brain that that diagnosis comes every single time that we see something unusual. Now, right. once you move out of ameloblastoma from the picture and once you actually, in a nice agreement with your brain, you both decide, I am not going to think in the diagnosis. Only after I finish my systematic description, I may will suggest a couple of diagnoses. So here we go. The five steps... I call the five Yepes steps, but they are not by no means Yepes, but it's a nice way to remember that when you see something unusual, remember Yepes, my Kentucky accent, now it's an Indiana accent, look at that lesion, tell your brain not to tell you the diagnosis, and then you can go, you know, the first step will be to decide if the lesion is radiolucent, radio, mi radio opaque, or mix. Okay. My mom can do that, Dr. Berg. I can explain to my mom what is the meaning of radiolucent and radio opaque, and she can do that. The second step is look at the lesion and tell me if the lesion is well-described, ill-described, or ill-defined. So you are going to look at how well or ill-defined is the lesion. The third step is you look at the lesion and look at the periphery or the, you know, what, what is around the lesion, and you can decide the if borders, the lesion is yes. corticated or non-corticated. And by cortication means a white line or white radiopaque line. Now, Dr. Berg, I need to stop here for two seconds. The step number four is really the one that makes the difference in the differential diagnosis. Describe what happened in the neighborhood. Think about the neighborhood. Do you see any resorption? Do you see any displacement? Do you see any potential expansion? Do you see any periosteal reaction? Anything that happened in the neighborhood is key in your final potential differential diagnosis. Even, and this is a little suggestion from my heart, if you are listening to this podcast, when you are writing the interpretation, 
please write even the negatives. There is no resorption, there is not displacement, there is not periostal reaction because that helps you right. at the end to provide the potential differential diagnosis. Now, the number five is where the lesion is located, about the size, and about the shape. With this, you will complete the five steps, and then at the end, based on my radiographic description, the most likely diagnosis is A, B, or C, and then you can either refer the patient, or if if you feel confident that this is maybe idiopathic bone sclerosis, you probably are going to stop there and then maybe follow the patient with a new film in two years. That's extremely helpful. I think that's an incredible part of what you're telling us today is this interpretation. It's It's a great reminder because I think we get into a pattern and we forget sometimes that we need to take the time and just describe what we see. That's what you're saying. Don't rush. We don't have to make a diagnosis. We just need to describe in a little bit more detail, as you've told us. So thank you so much for that. We will now pause for a word from our sponsor. Hugh Freedy is the global leader in dental instrument manufacturing, offering pediatric restorative solutions that keep you performing at your best. For more information on Hugh Freedy products, Visit www.hughfreedy.com slash AAPD crowns. We're back with Dr. Juan Yepes. We're talking about imaging and aspects of it. And we just talked about the Yepes method, the five steps that we can use to interpret an image. That's something we should be thinking about as we look at all of our images and make some notation regarding that. Now I want to get into some nuts and bolts questions related to radiology and imaging. First of all, just some quick questions. Uh, We're mainly using digital. Is there any reason to use film anymore, by the way? Is film gone forever? Um, I don't think so. Films are gone forever. But I can tell you that probably 80 to 85% of the dentists in the country are finally moving into digital radiology. Some practices, they are still using conventional radiology, but... Very soon, I believe, everybody will be working in the digital radiology world. So I mean, one great thing about right, digital is the storage capability. Another is the amount of radiation. Is it true that you have significantly less radiation using digital than film? Dr. Berg, I love this. I love this podcast. Honestly, I feel so... This is the issue. Digital radiology is no 99% less radiation compared with conventional films as sometimes... In some places, they try to sell you the system as 99% less radiation. I think so generally speaking, digital radiology requires less radiation. First statement, that's right. The second statement is that less radiation of the digital systems is around 40 to 50%. That's right. The third statement is if you want to be in the same page with decreasing the radiation that you need to generate the image, Listen to this. You need to set up the X-ray machine according to the system that you are using. And finally, yes, it's light radiation. As I said, you need light radiation to create the image. But Dr. Berg, retakes are a lot easier. So yeah. my friends and my colleagues listen to this podcast. Keep tracking of the retakes in your office. Keep doing that. That's a wonderful way to do retraining with your staff. And also to see if your office is operating in that maybe 10 to 20% okay retakes. That means that for every 10 films that you take in a pediatric dental practice, you may end up retaking one or two films because the patient moves or the patient bites you or whatever. But if you don't track your retakes, digital radiology could be the opposite. You may end up... You could end up more because it's so easy to take uh, other images. Dr. Berg, remember the old days. Remember the pain of retaking a film. Yeah, you avoid it. Now it's like, (laughs) oh, no problem. We'll just take two or three. And we do see this phenomenon. And I think because of that, it would actually seem like it would be one of the best quality improvement things we could do in our offices as we're looking for those projects, which are always good is track the retakes. I think that's a great idea. Track the retakes that we're doing so we actually do end up with significantly less radiation. Or, or Dr. Berg, you can actually just track the retakes five days in a month. You can just decide which a time frame. And, and then yeah. at the end of the week, you can say, well, you know, our retake was 40% or 50% or 90%. So, so what you're saying is the, fa- the fact that we have less radiation is not an excuse for going back to good technique and radiation hygiene. And I I think there's a group out there called uh, Image Gently or something like that. 
that, yes. that is all about uh, this concept of really having a good mindfulness around uh, imaging. Is that right? Yes, Image Gently. I was uh, a member of Image Gently. I was the representative of the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology in the early days of Image Gently. Such a wonderful experience. I love the name Image Gently, that yes. pretty much we need to recognize that radiation is our friend, but we need to be very very conscious about the use of radiation right. in the most sensitive population, which is the kids. And let me add something that I need to say, because not just only track your retakes, but also if you want to work in a pretty radiation safety office, use rectangular collimator. Let's leave it like that. I was that. just going to ask you that. So okay. have we, do we, do we still need to use those, right? Absolutely, Dr. Berg. You need to, you know, my colleagues who are listening to this podcast, you must think seriously to use rectangular collimators. And if you decide to use rectangular collimators, you always need to use the X-ray positional device. It's called XCP in some places, but rectangular collimator is the single most effective way to decrease the amount of radiation to our patients. Now, if you use rectangular collimators and you don't use the X-ray positional device, big, big problem because your retakes will go skyrocket because the problem with rectangular collimators is you may well get more concats if right. you don't use the XCP. Yeah, they both go together. You got to have both. So that's a that's another wonderful, great reminder. So speaking of uh, radiation dose and, uh, and the quality of images that we take, tell me your take on sensors or phosphorus plates. Easy answer. And this is, Dr. Berg, my opinion, and we can keep going three hours. I have my opinion, too, if I'm not a radiologist. I think so. A good pediatric dental practice who provide care to patients under the age of 18 and special needs must operate in both systems. I call a hybrid office. That means that you have the capabilities of phosphorus plates and you also have sensors. And the right. reason is pretty simple. In the little ones, patients under the age of four, patients under the age of five, there is no question that the phosphorus plates will provide you a better option to get a good quality film. And it makes sense because the phosphorus plates are smaller, thinner, easier to place in the mouth. And for the older patients, I don't see any problem using the sensors. So hybrid means that you operate in both sides. I don't think so. A system fits all. I don't belong to that group of dentists who can take any patient age, yeah. they can use the sensors. I don't... I, I agree, and I think that's the experience of colleagues I've spoken with. You know, one thing about the phosphor plates on the negative side of only having those is there's a tendency to want to reuse them more often and past their lifetime, their natural lifespan. You see cracks, and then the images aren't good. You have to retake images. It goes back to the radiation hygiene and gentle imaging. Yes, absolutely. Um uh, if you use the phosphorus plates, you need to keep in mind that over time, the phosphorus plates will lost some of the ability to capture a great image. And, uh, but, you know, you just buy a new plate and, um, and, and, and you continue, you know, taking the films. So you track the day that you buy the plate and then you can start to calculate how many months that plate will give you good images. I want to shift gears for a moment uh, as we get to our last round of questions uh, about these other image types. Uh, you know, cone beams, we often get those for orth orthodontic treatment uh, for other reasons. The oral surgeons may use them for positioning of third molars. But what about MRIs? You know, we know how important they have become in medicine. And perhaps for those who specialize in TMJ uh, disorders, there, there's a need. Is there a need for us to ever recommend an MRI? I think so. There is a need to recommend an MRI, Dr. Burke. I don't think so. It's a daily situation that we will require an MRI. MRI is the gold standard for soft tissues. So uh, maybe some of my colleagues and some of the pediatric dentists, they work with adolescents, and sometimes you can get some temporomandibular -like joint issues. And obviously, the MRI will be the perfect technique for soft tissues and looking at the disc and look at, looking if the disc is displaced or not. But um, I don't believe that, you know, that MRI will be in the front line of our imaging toolbox. Now, in the next maybe 10 years, I'm sure we are going to have the capabilities to have MRIs smaller, maybe mm -hmm. more accessible to us, and that maybe will open up a, a field of uh, imaging in pediatric dentistry. Okay. 
So I want to talk a little bit in the last moments on periodicity. You know, we we're all confronted with the ability to take films based on what is compensated for. Um, you know, we, we learn that we should examine patients prior to making a determination that even bite wings are necessary at this point in time. And also with panoramics, you know, there's, there's so-called allowed to be taken at certain times. Can you give us sort of a guideline, uh, you know, based of course on the APD guidelines for periodicity related to all radiographic imaging that we would perform in the office? I'm talking about ionizing radiation, of course. Yes, yes. We, we are using this day, the 2012 FDA and American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommendations and criteria for the use of radiation ionizing or ionizing radiation. Very soon, because I know the ADA is working in an update of the recommendations and criteria, so I expect that in 2021 we are going to see a new recommendations and criteria. However, the best way to answer and the quickest way is justification. You always need to have a justification behind that film. You need to have a reason. If you have a reason, absolutely you are going to decrease the number of radiographs that you take in children. That justification could be carry risk. Justification could be trauma. Justification could be it's time to evaluate grow and development. Justification could be swallowing. Justification could be numbness, whatever. But you need to have a justification. I... Through the years, I published a couple of articles looking at dentists if they follow the recommendations. And interesting, Dr. Burke, the majority of dentists, we follow the recommendations and we follow the, the guidelines. We have a couple of outliers who usually are the ones who may take more films that we are expecting. And, uh, and that outliers are the ones that we want to target when we are looking in the reevaluation of the guidelines. Yeah, that's that's a great perspective on that and very succinct, I would say. So the last thing I want to talk to you about, Dr. Yepes, is, is the future of radiology and, and imaging and pediatric dentistry. One of the things that excites me, and I, I, I'm very interested in the topic of medical management of caries. I'm seeing a lot of uh, light devices that don't use ionizing radiation that allow us to see caries lesions more precisely, not quite at the level of a bite wing yet, but I think we're going to get there. So I wanted to ask you your take on the exciting future of imaging in pediatric dentistry. Yeah, I'm very excited, as you are. Um, I think so the technologies, transillumination and laser fluorescent and the other technologies who are coming these days, eventually they will get pretty close to radiation or ionizing radiation. I think so the new technologies who are coming, they are still having some issues in terms of the ability of the operator and the training of the operator, because if you don't have enough experience or enough training, you may actually end up with uh, a lot of false positives, which means that you may end up saying there is decay here when maybe it's not decay. I think so ionizing radiation will continue around us for a long time, and I feel so happy about that. X-rays were discovered by the 1890-something, and I think so X-rays will continue around us for 100 years more. We are going to be more effective. We are going to use less ionizing radiation, more sensitive sensors, more sensitive phosphor plates. And obviously, all these emerging technologies, transillumination, laser fluorescent, and the other technologies, they will be in an imaging toolbox. And I think so in some cases, with some patients, there is no question that all these no ionizing imaging options will play a significant role. But to finish, Dr. Burke, I think it's important for the listener, listeners to understand that all these emerging no-ionizing technologies, they require very high training. That's something yes. that will take you time, and, and otherwise you probably will end up seeing a lot more lesions that they are really lesions in the patient's mouth. Yes, a lot of false positives. Dr. Yepes, thank you so much for being with us again today. We're going to have you back on uh, many of the other topics of interest that you have so much information to share with us in. Thank you for being with us today on Pedo Teeth Talk. Dr. Berg, thank you so much, and thank you to all the listeners. I appreciate that. And thank you for listening today on Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you in your practice, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. We'll see you here next time. Do you need additional CE hours but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? Check out AAPD's new Education Passport. The redesigned and improved Education Passport is AAPD's online learning center where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit educationpassport.aapd.org 
for more information. For 10% off any product, use discount code Teeth Talk in the Education Passport Store. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.